Hey there, listeners, and welcome to episode number 93 for the National Land Realty Podcast, where we discuss all things land. Our goal here is to inform, educate, and entertain those of you who own land or are interested in the buying and selling of land throughout the United States. My name is Mac Christian, and I am the Chief Marketing Officer here at National Land Realty. I'll be your host for this episode. Now, I want to drop everything that I'm doing, live in the outdoors, and guide a hunting or fishing business just what I want to do. And there's probably not an outdoors enthusiast out there who hasn't thought of it themselves. Half of you listening have probably already worked as a guide at some point in your life. Now, for those of you who have thought about running your own outfitting business, we're here today to talk with Todd Dye. Todd is a managing broker in Idaho, and he has found a little bit of a niche in the facilitation of selling outfitting businesses throughout the state. Now, whether it's how to buy or how to sell an outfitting business, or what red flags to look for, we're gonna cover that here. Now sit back and enjoy. Okay, so I am sitting here with Todd Dye. And Todd, you've got a unique background and what you've been working with lately uh, as far as, uh, and we'll get into that. I don't wanna give it away just yet, but um, that's so. What I what I do want to ask you is, how did you get into land real estate to begin with, and kind of what what brought you to where you are now? All right. Well, it was interesting. I was working as a law enforcement officer, and uh, when I invested in a rental house, my realtor talked me into getting my real estate license because he saw I had a I like real estate. I had a passion for it, and he talked me into kind of doing it on the side or part time. So I was doing that when one day I noticed across the street from the police department where I worked, there was a real estate company that opened and it had an elk in the logo. And that really caught my interest because I like big game hunting. Elk hunting is one of my favorite. And uh, so one day I just, I just, I had to check it out. I walked in there and introduced myself and told them I noticed the elk in the logo and thought it was unique. I started talking to him, and it was a broker who focused on land. Um, he did farms, ranches, hunting property, rural property. I mean, this guy wouldn't list a house in town if it was going to save his life, right? Um, and I thought it was pretty interesting. And after I left, about a week later, they called me back and asked me if I wanted to hang my license with them. And so, so I did. And I started. They started teaching me the land industry, and it was with them that I sold my first. Um, horse property that had an indoor riding arena and an outdoor arena. And, you know, they rented out places for the horses and, um, you know, did that. I sold my first cattle ranch there. And so I started learning the land industry. So then after I retired um, from law enforcement and um, set up here in southeastern Idaho, that's just what I continued. So I spent about 10 or 12 years there working for that broker. And uh, it was a good experience where he he taught me the land industry. Or that's how I got in land. He started to. I'm still learning, but he's <laughs> he started my education. I was going to say it's an always kind of learning thing, right? So it's just a, a <laughs> it never ends. Um, that's correct. So in, in the conversation here, like of course you work with selling ranches and farms and and hunting properties and recreational properties and just you know. The same as all of us, right? So, uh, but we're here today to talk about a different sort of transaction, and and specifically, we're working with outfitters and setting up succession or the sales of outfitting businesses, which gets associated as land, but a lot of times it's a lease contract and it comes down to assets. But let's get into those particulars. And I, and I just wanted to ask you kind of like, how did you even stumble on this? Cause it, it, cause it's a very much a niche in what you do and how did you stumble into it? And and what's the learning curve and you know, what, what was the beginning of this like? Well, I, uh, I've been on some hunts with outfitters before. Um, and I have seen that a lot of outfitters have land. You know, a lot of these outfitters have livestock that they need to care for, or so they have place for their livestock. They have they might have cropland to to raise feed for the livestock, and so selling land. These are people that I wanted to meet, and also selling land. I met a lot of hunters, 
that are looking for property to hunt on. And they're always, we're talking about hunts we've been on and things. And a lot of them have been with hunting with outfitters. And I realized it just hit me one day that, you know what, there's not that big of a jump between selling hunting land or land to an outfitter or that an outfitter has and outfitting businesses. It's, I'm dealing with, we're working with the same client customer base. They're the same people. Um, and so I was talking to an outfitter about land. He had his business for sale. I think I saw that I could reach people interested in outfitting business through some of our same marketing channels or the same marketing techniques. And I just made that jump. It really wasn't that big. And I've there's been more education on because there are some differences in selling somebody's business. But when it comes down to it, I'm still working with the people I like to work with. And so that's what made it nice. Um, you know, for me, and I've developed some good friendships by working with outfitters and helping them with their business. And in the, the difference being that, you know, if, and we'll take the, we'll take the case of land out of it, which is kind of weird to do on a land podcast, but <laughs> let's do that because what, what you were just talking about is selling a business and as, as a real estate agent selling a business, what's the what's the process that you had to go through how did you get how did you make that jump and and i mean i realize it's working with the same people but it's a different there's different logistics right well there are different logistics. so the first thing i realized that if if you sell a business by selling all the assets of that business without selling stocks or shares in it um if you if and most outfitting guide businesses aren't set up with stocks and shares, right? It's it's a it's a business. Most of them, it's it's either a couple of partners or it's a husband and wife running it. And if you sell all the assets of that, there's no license required to to sell that. And anybody could help them sell it. I was going to say because if 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 you're working with stocks and shares, you probably need like a Series Seven to be able to work with it. I'm guessing is that as a security license i guess is you need some kind of security license yeah i don't work with the stocks and shares so so i don't know exactly what kind of license you need but what, what the outfitters i've worked with um it's generally been a sole proprietorship or it's been an llc right and we don't even necessarily sell that llc we just sell all the assets to it to another buyer who may create his own llc and eventually we may get the original seller to give up their DBA or they're doing business as. So the same name, the new seller can use the same name of the outfit for the customers and clients that are hunting their consistency. But um, we sell the assets. And so the business is transferred by selling all the assets and different businesses there's probably permits and helping the buyer get licensed and we're putting all that we're just helping people put all that together and in the process i mean as you're talking your way through it sounds very similar to what you would work through in land as in you look at the asset you take a proper valuation of the asset you subtract any debt and then you look at the traditional history of cash flow to try to assess what it's worth in the future, as well as client base. And it, and and in that regard, like it's it works like a hunting tract, right? If if you have, especially if it's a hunting tract where you're leasing it to hunters, or you could even look at it as an agriculture tract where where you it provides income and you have to take your debt and you have to take the equipment and you have to properly evaluate it. And I as it, it makes a lot of sense as you're talking your way through it. As you talked through it before, like, and we've gone gone through this conversation before. It's like getting getting your head around, like, well, you you're saying that selling land is similar to an outfitting business, and that's and I think that's what you're hitting on, right? Is that that when you take the valuation of the asset and that whole process of putting it into a package and putting it up for sale is very very similar. 
It is. It, you know, a lot of it comes down to the profit and loss and and what can be made and when how could how soon could the new buyer expect to pay that off. But you're right, it's very similar to you're selling agricultural land. Um we've seen potential buyers walk away because the seller may want too much for the land. The price is too high. And really what he's saying is there's not going to be a, enough profit in there for him to sustain um, sustain all the efforts he's going to have to put into to, to raising those crop and, and doing that. Alpha D and Guidemen, same thing. This, they're putting effort into um, sustaining a hunting base, people who are going to come and pay for them to guide them out hunting. Is that profit and loss going to work for them? And how the business is going to run. So it is very similar. And it's in the the dynamics of outfitting vary quite a bit, right? Like you because I mean I and I just I've said that because you and I have talked before. And you know, originally what I was looking at picking up the possibility of an outfitting business, but it was one of those where okay, I don't have time to be backcountry all the time. So if it can run itself and I can manage it from a distance and just work on the business side of it and have people managing it, great. And then when, when we got into the numbers, it's like, no, that's never going to work. But there's but there's other outfitters that do exactly that, where they're not in the field every day. I think you've worked with a couple here lately that they're like that. Um, you know, what's the variance on how those outfitting businesses work? And does it come down to the area that they are or just how they run their business? Well, a lot of it is how they run their business. And um, and I would say how they choose to run their business. Uh, because some owners want to be in that backcountry. Some owners, you know, love being in the backcountry. And without the cell service and without Wi-Fi, and they just like that relationship and they like spending time with the clients there and getting out and ensuring that they have a great trip. Um, other outfits, the owners want to be more just the managers and and maybe the face of it and get people get hunters coming in, introducing them to the guides, getting them out in the field but they stay back and they manage that. And so when we're helping people find the right business, that's part of it is figuring out what businesses that we know that might be for sale are going to match what this potential buyer is looking for and what they want to accomplish. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about, you know, tell me a little bit about, and, and I, I can imagine this was difficult the first time around is going in and getting a proper assessment evaluation. Um, but I mean, you've done it a few times now. You're, you're pretty experienced. And, you know, so so how do you go through that when you are and and, and was and, and am I right? Was it rough at first or or did you just like did you nail it? it it's still rough. <laughs> <laughs> And and I must have been one and say and and I'm not the one doing it. Okay. Um, and it requires cooperation from the outfitter that owns the business. And there's a couple of ways to get the assessment. Um, first of all, is the books. You can get an assessment by well, it's a lot of it's always going to come down to the books, but if you can get an accountant, an accountant can do an assessment. And really it comes down to what money's coming in and what money's being expensed, spent and how much is left over, right? That's what the value comes down to. Um, it doesn't matter really how good the hunting is. If the business is losing money every year, it's not going to be a valuable business. Even if they are have the have trophy game out there, you know, it's, it's that. And so one way is to get an accountant and it's, it's interesting. I talked to a lot of sellers and these these outfitting owners, most of them have owned their business for a long time. And they've got a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that they put into that business. I mean, it's a backbreaking business sometimes, right? It's a lot of physical uh labor, hiking around with clients, getting them in, packing elk out, throwing hay for horses, doing things. It can be 
just go, they have a lot of effort. So they all, all outfitters think their businesses are very valuable. But it comes down to what do the books show? And so I recommend getting an accountant to go through and let the profit and loss. And I understand we all, all business owners write off everything they can and show it as a loss, right? I mean, in the real estate world, we write off our cell phone, we write off our Wi-Fi, we write off our office space, we write off our mileage. Everybody wants to take all the deductions they can, right? Nobody wants to give extra money to the government. So these outfitters are doing the same thing, but that doesn't, because they're writing everything off, doesn't mean they're losing money. So we want an accountant in there that can show us the the actual cash the value yeah. that there's money left over. Now, the the thing that I think is even better is there are a few people out there who have a lot of experience with the outfitting and guide business. A lot of accountants do it, you know, they can be an accountant for this outfitting and guide business. They can be an accountant for a convenience store. They might be an accountant for the dentist office and they don't necessarily have, they have a lot of book experience, but not necessarily being in the back country experience. So there's a few people out there that have both that have outfitting experience and accounting experience, and they can value a business. Um, and valuing an outfitting business is different than even the appraiser from the bank going out and valuing, evaluating some land. One of the examples I give, an outfitter's livestock, the horse or mule that they have is generally trained to um, pack and to respond to anybody riding it because it could be any hunters and every hunter that comes in has a different level of experience of being on a horse or a mule. Some of these animals, I was on an outfit once where we were, we left at three o'clock in the morning because we were going to go way back one day. We were going 12 miles back or something like that. We left in the dark and I was amazed. We turned our flashlights off and it was moonlight and stars is the only light we had. And these horses and mules are going down the trail. And at one point I could hear the creek about 50 feet below me. And it's dark and these animals are still packing people down there. Now that's a different quality of animal than the the horse somebody gives their kid to take to 4-H. I was gonna say too, and like you gotta take into account as well, how many, and I'm not going to assume everybody listening has been around horses. I am not a master horseman by any means, but I do know that a lot of horses out there are jerks and it's only one person <laughs> on the planet that can ride them to right. have a horse that's trained to accept anybody and ride them through the wilderness is kind of a that increases the value substantially. And unless somebody doing the valuation understands that you could really get an improper valuation is what kind of where I think you're, you're correct is what I'm picking up. And an evaluation can also change based on the area they're hunting in. We all know that there are some hunting areas that are better than other hunting areas. So you may have two exact businesses, but just hunt in different areas and the values may be different just because of where they hunt. So you, not all accountants are going to understand that either. So you need somebody who can understand that and they might use a different multiplier when they're doing the EBITDA and figured out the value of that business. But it's important to figure that out for every seller because I guarantee you every buyer is going to be worried about the value. And I understand that the seller thinks their business is valued to the max, right? Just like every landowner thinks their land is valued at the max. Every homeowner thinks their house is valued at the most, right? We've got a personal interest in it, but we've got to get a realistic value established. And that is one of the most important things at getting to a successful sale. I, I was going to say that's the uh, the uh, the emotional value that you run into a lot of times, where someone wants to sell the land, and they're like, you know, that's that's the rock I proposed to my wife on, or you know, I'm just making <laughs> up stuff, right? But like, that's the rock I proposed to my wife on. That's a valuable rock, and to anybody else that's coming in to buy it, that is just a rock, right? And and it, that's you have to take that, of course, like to whatever it is like the the field right like w whatever grows up out of you know the land for agriculture could be more valuable because you grew it but to everybody else it's just corn right so it's 
it, there's a huge difference there that it, that it's almost like you're almost taking on a counseling role, right? Where when you're working with somebody, walking them down, like, okay, like I understand. And you put a lot of blood, sweat and tears into this, but this is, this is the market value of, of what you have here, the, the asset. Right. It's a typical conversation. <laughs> yes. And if we can get an independent valuation on it, that independent valuation holds more weight to a prospective buyer because a prospective buyer almost always think if the owner says this is what the value is, they assume it's going to be biased towards that emotional value that that owner is going to put on it. So having something that's an independent valuation um, can really help get a buyer to progress to the point where they might be putting that offer in and working down and getting to that successful sale. And so how how have you gone about, you know, we've kind of gone into a little bit of the, the valuation. Well, I guess a better question is, are we skipping anything in the valuation process? Because we, we kind of talked about horses. Uh, we've talked about the, the the hunting land itself. What about pots and pans and stuff like that? You just look at open market, like what is this pot and pan worth kind of thing? Yes, we and... Most outfitters have, you know, pots and pans and knives and forks, and we don't necessarily count every knife and fork and spoon, you know, but we okay, they've got a camp set up for that will hold maybe four hunters, two guides, a cook, and it's got a kitchen, and you've got this full camp. We'll look at the big items, the wall tents, you know, but we will get a breakdown of those assets, and it might say there's, you know, 10 wall tents that are this size and that, but then we're going to get down. It might be there's, there's one set of cookware, right. For this camp, instead of having, you know, there's four pots and two of them are frying pans and, you know, oh, getting okay. yeah. the, the detail like that. I've got six sets of forks and spoons, you know, and um, so you might get down to where you got one kitchen set or one camp set worth of kitchenware or things. Gotcha. And so once you get this all grouped up, so you, you go through the process and I'm the, so the process is you go in and you, the most important part of any transaction like this, whether it's land or something like this is going to be the valuation. Because if you go to market with, you know, the wrong valuation, it doesn't sell or it sells really fast and you missed out on possible capitalization, right? Like you, if you go too low, it's going to go out right out from under your feet before you even know it. And you realize you missed out on some money or it just hangs out forever and no one wants to even touch it. So you get the valuation down. How do you go to market with it? What's the process there? Well, so when you when you get the valuation down and we know what we're going to put it on the market for. Um, what an agent will do for that outfitter is prepare a portfolio or something that they can give to any potential buyers. I like to have that list of assets down to everything. And I like to include pictures of all the assets and like to be detailed. Um, just one kind of side note is an outfitter may require a non-disclosure agreement be signed prior to getting some of that information. And generally we'll provide some basic information about the outfit to a potential buyer that may or may not include even the name of the business. And when they, if that potential buyer is in interest, we'll often get a non-disclosure agreement signed. Um, for one, we're gonna be giving up some financial information and we don't want, you know, that, you know, shared in the restaurant that it, with everybody that's uh, in the restaurant, you know. I was just gonna say, cause a lot of these things are in a small town and you know, that's exactly, do you know what Bob made last year in that outfit? Like, it, like it would be that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, you know, it would get around. So, and the other thing we want to protect is advantage of both the current owner and any person, the next owner, because you also don't want a lot of this information getting out to clients that are coming in and booking hunts. If they see that the business is for sale, there may be a fear that that means um, they're not going to be able to hunt with their favorite outfitter, or it could mean, well, maybe there's trouble going on and the current owner doesn't want to lose those bookings. Well, neither does the current, the buyer that's going to come in either. 
They don't want to lose those clients that have been coming for a long time. Um, even though they were really close with the current owner, they may build a relationship with this guy. So both of them want those people still to come. So non-disclosure is in the best interest of both sides to keep everything confidential. Right. So, so once you have that set up, is it, does it come down to then just getting it, the awareness out there and in photography and that kind of stuff, or, or what's, what's sort of, uh, you know, how do you, how do you get people aware of this wholesale? Well, that's where the marketing comes in. And that's where there's an advantage of having a real estate broker or somebody working with the seller, because we've been marketing land and property for a long time. And we were just like on, you know, people will often go to National Land Realty website and see lots of great land out there. When they're doing their internet search, it's pulling people to our website, even for these outfitting and guide businesses, um, as well as these brokers know where else to market the this property. Um, you know, we're marketing land on more than just our website, right? There's other websites that we reach out to. National Land, when somebody lists their land with them, when it goes on hundreds of websites, right? It gets out there. We do the same thing with outfitting and guide businesses. Plus, there's a few places that we can go to that are specific where we can find people interested in outfitting and guide businesses that we can put um, this marketing out there and... We've got experience with how to write it up, what might draw people to it, getting the right amount of information out there to get somebody to pick up that phone and call and inquire about it. So what does somebody want to look like? Because I mean, you know, this is it, 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 <laughs> everything that you just discussed is taking it from from the beginning conversation to giving it proper value to getting it in the marketplace from there. It comes down to the buyers. So let's look at this from the buyer's perspective. If I'm interested in buying an outfitting business, first of all, let, let's take it, let's take it like I don't know anything, and which is probably a bad situation to get into, anyways. Uh, but let's take it from that angle because you know, why not? It's, it's more fun that way, right? But what do I want to look at in the valuation, in the functioning of the outfitting business? Um, what are my, what, what should my concerns be and, and how do I want to dig into this? Well, the first thing, if there's a buyer that comes to us and as you say, doesn't know anything, then we have to have a serious conversation about the, uh, the plausibility of actually closing on a business. Um, a lot of states out there require an outfitter who's going to be hosting clients and coming in to obtain a license. And I get phone calls from people, yeah, I've hunted all my life. You know, now I, I just want to, I want to do what I love for a living, right? Having hunting experience doesn't guarantee you that you're going to get an outfitting license. Um, the, I was going to say loving, loving to eat chocolate chip cookies doesn't mean you can make them. <laughs> correct. Yeah. So some of the things that people don't realize that they're looking for to give you a license is not just your hunting experience but it's your guiding experience. Can you take care of a client in the back country? So there's some first aid requirements that you need to understand, um, some mapping requirements, some things that you're gonna to need to do and how to actually take somebody in the back country and guide them. As well as that, to be an owner of an outfitting business, they wanna make sure that you understand how to manage employees. Um, the licensing board wants to make sure that People who are coming in and spending money here um, are going to be treated right and taken care of. So they want to make sure that your employees know how to treat them and that you're taking care of your employees so that they'll stick around and can provide a good experience. You know, it, it's not a good hunting experience for somebody if their guide walks out in the middle of the hunt because they're frustrated with the outfitter. Right, because he's not running things properly. So the licensing board wants to make sure that the owner has experience in managing employees as well as guiding. It's not 
really hunting is the least thing they're worried about somebody being able to hunt or having hunting experience i was going to say yeah the the well and the 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 board what is it is an outfitting board what is it called (laughs) well here in idaho it's called the idaho outfitter and guys licensing board okay so it is it is the outfitting board so uh with a lot more words in there but if somebody comes into the state and has a bad experience with one outfitter, that sort of sinks all the outfitters, right? Like, out, you know, it could easily get construed that Idaho guides are trash. Like, and I'm just using <laughs> Idaho that, that it, in that case, if one person has a bad experience with a guide, it affects everybody. And if and, and so you want an industry that kind of holds a certain line that that is good for everybody and making sure that everybody's on the up and up because and then and the other part is because and then correct me if i'm wrong but like in order to guide you have to lease a certain area to be able to guide in like you have this one you know from from this river to that river and to those mountains or or it, maybe it's the whole hunting unit but you have permission to, to guide there that's a resource and if you don't manage the resource appropriately meaning like it, if if you're not giving good experiences to that area, that's an area that somebody else could have provided a great experience. It's 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 a limited resource that they can license. And so they want to make sure that the, all that stuff happens. So, yeah, there's a lot of things to go into there, right? Yes, they and here in Idaho, Outfitters do get permits from usually the National Forest Service, and they are given those areas to operate in. And you're right, the National Forest Service does you let the Outfitters pay for that. Um, that permit for the area, you know, to be able to hunt in there. And you're right, the board wants people to have good experiences. They want, and they want those permits to be productive and provided good experiences and used, you know, in that right, in the right way with the limitations, you know, an outfitter can't come in and, you know, do 40,000 hunts in here, right? There's a certain number of hunters that they can bring in there so that we're managing the resource as well so with that management of course we want quality um quality run hunts for those hunts that are being allowed in there yeah that's the other side of it too is you they got to know that you're going to stick to the rules and not try to break any kind of like hunting laws or stuff like that you know that your character matters as well um when it comes down to so from a buyer's perspective evaluating the assets because that's really what kind of goes into this is you know the value of the horses the value of you you mentioned the tents and stuff like that is one of the biggest expenses that you're going to find and we're talking specifically hunting outfitting right um you know because it's a whole different level of the logistics if you're talking fishing like in our area chances of fishing are going to be fly fishing or steelhead fishing and then you got to evaluate rafts or jet boats but it's going to go through the same process um if you are the buyer coming in there how do you yourself go about evaluating it is it where you want to double check with your accountant you want to get eyes on and hands on or are they just getting pictures like how how in depth does that part of the process go and how far should they go well so yeah the buyer needs to verify that they think the value is there so one of the general guidelines is that if a buyer came in and took the net proceeds, not the gross, but the net proceeds from that outfitting business, if they did not take a salary or keep any money for themselves, could they pay for that business in five years with those net proceeds? That's the general guideline of where the value should be. Now, obviously it can change because of our asset list. You know, the the value of that business might change if it comes with a brand new Duramax, you know, pickup with a brand new horse trailer versus, you know, the 1995 pickup that they're pulling the horse trailer with, right? <laughs> you know, there's a, a difference in that value. So that's a general rule. Um, that you look at the value, but they need to verify that. And so they should be able, they should, the buyer should be able or want to take what's provided from the seller, whether it's from the accountant or from that other professional that 
understands outpaying business and accounting and gives a value, they want to look at that. And certainly, depending upon the buyer's level of experience, they can take those to their accountant or to an accountant, or if they think they can do it themselves, but they do need to look at that and make confirm in their mind and heart that the value is there or what they're going to offer for this business and eventually pay for it is where it needs to be. So when they're looking at the books, it, it, I mean, in, in my mind, it's you want to look at the cash flow, see what comes out in net. Like that's that's really where you're headed in the end. Like what and can it be more efficient than it is or is it already as efficient as it can be is, is where you want to head. How do you double check it to make sure that, you know, if let, let's say let's say Todd dies working with the with the seller and maybe you you took some some leeway on the numbers and let them slide some things in. How would somebody double check it and know that they that the, the books are lining up? Well, another way to look at it is almost every outfitter um, here in Idaho has to submit a report at the end there. We call it a use um, the actual use report. And so that's when they're reporting to the National Forest exactly how many hunts they guided in those permitted areas. Okay, now some of these hunters can have private property hunts as well. So you're going to ask them well, what hunts they did, but you're going to look at the actual number of hunts they did during the year. And you can start double checking the value just by doing the math. Okay, well, this outfitter ran 40 elk hunts, um, you know, and did, well, this for numbers, you need 40 bear hunts, 40 elk hunts, 10 lion hunts, you know. Um, and you have a okay, set then, price for that, so you can take that. Then there's a price for that. So you, you yeah. can see what the income should have been, right? And maybe you're going to talk to them because some outfitters, you know, they'll give the return customer a discount or something. So that's all right. So we, But we can figure out what the income is. And most people looking at going into the outfitting business have an idea of what it's going to cost to run a hunt. You know, there's cost associated with it. Um, you have to pay your guides. You've got food that you're supplying. You've got wear and tear on all your equipment. You've got the gas to get there and back. You know, you're taking care of your livestock. You're replacing livestock occasionally, right? But you can look at that and figure out about what it should be. You know, whether you think that, uh, you know, you're running to a 40% profit margin or a 50% profit margin. So I can look at that. Okay, well, then my net income should be this if I did this many hunts. Now, does that match the valuation that was provided either through the accountant or another professional looking at the books? Which, I mean, that's a, that's a very sensible way to go through it. it like That's, yep, <laughs> that checks out. <laughs> I wanted to ask, so you've worked on these transactions for a while now, and I, I'm going to go ahead and speak for everybody that could be listening or not listening. I think everybody who has ever been outdoors, hunting, fishing, any of that, I think every single one of us has probably had the fantasy of like, man, what if I just like drop the desk job and just did that? What I want to pack all my stuff into the wilderness and just guide that would be great because I, I know personally, I've thought about it. I would say no less than five times a year for the last 20 years. So okay. <laughs> so from from what you've seen. How difficult is it to jump into? If it has to be when you jump into an outfitting and guide business, you're jumping into a lifestyle. This is not a job where you you punch in on the time clock and you punch out. They're worried about their business 24-7. You know, 365 days a year, they're worried about their business. Are they going to get enough hunters? What do they need to do? What do they need to do things? And it's the lifestyle. Um, some of these hunters in the fall will start going in the backcountry at the end of August they're starting to pack in camps, setting them up, prepping for hunters that are starting to coming, you know, beginning or mid September. Um, and sometimes they're working 
seven days a week from the end of August until hunting season is over and they're pulling calves out in the middle of November. And so they've got the three, four months there where it's not a 40 hour work week, it's a hundred hour work week. You know, they're putting a lot of, and a lot of that time they're in the back country. So there's no cell service. There's no um, internet, you know, they're not real accessible to the rest of the world while they're back there. So it takes a certain personality that is willing to be in that back country and away from society for such a period of time. You know, I was going to say that in the tremendous combination of skill sets that you have to have, like you might have it in your head that you're going to go out and play in the outdoors all day. Like, no, that's just maybe a fraction of it. The other half is you have to be able to do all of that, dedicate that time and put up with like, I'm, I'm going to assume that not all clients are the same and that some of them you want to absolutely leave in the wilderness tied to a tree and like wrap a stake to their leg and hope a cougar finds them. Like never. <laughs> I mean, that part of the business when you, you pick up because people are going to people and you can fix all the logistical problems in the world. You will never, ever fix all the people problems. You're going to have people in the wilderness that are awful and you have to maintain and and to boot you're not hunting <laughs> you know you're letting them right um you don't get to pull the trigger and and i know some outfitters that for those reasons won't book online they book everything face to face through hunting shows i know other outfitters that don't want to spend their spring driving from hunting show to hunting show to hunting show to book the camps so they will book online um, and so they all choose how they manage their business. But I guess the point is making if you're getting into the business, you got to realize that there are months where you are completely tied up and not available. Now, there may be other months that you're completely available. You know, February, there's not, if you're not going to a few shows that start mid February, you can have a whole month off. You're, you're done with your lion hunts by then. You haven't started the bear hunts in the spring yet. And fall hunting's over, your reports are in, you know, you might be off for, you know, February, March. Don't have to do anything. And that kind of makes up for those three or four months you've spent completely in there. Um, and so when you're looking at it, that's what I mean, it's a lifestyle. Can you live that lifestyle? Are, are you okay with that? And somebody needs to, especially... If they're going to be a hands-on owner that might be out there doing some of the guiding. So the the one piece of this I guess we haven't covered is the financials and not and not from the seller side. We did discuss that, but from the buyer side, do you typically see because because it's hard to evaluate and because there's valuation based on animals? Do you typically see this being a like a more of a cash transaction situation, or do you see like small business finance involved in this when people are going to purchase an outfitting business? Um, I have yet to not only see but even hear of somebody getting a loan from a bank to buy an outfitting and guide business. I'm sure it's been done. I just haven't heard of it. Um, so typically. It is cash, but that doesn't mean if you don't have enough cash to pay for business, you know, <clears throat> these outfitting and guide businesses can run anywhere between $250,000 up to a million and a half, you know, or even, well, they oh, can, yeah. they can yeah. even go above that, you know, depending upon if they come with land and real estate and things. So if they come with land, then you can get financing on the land portion. And we can separate those two in a, in the, in the purchase, you write two contracts one for the business, one for the land, you may be able to get financing for the land, or if it comes with a residence for the residence, you know, or a cabin or a lodge, you can get financing for that. But to get financing for the business, I haven't, that's what I haven't seen or heard of. Um, so we can separate them if we need to get financing for some. But when it comes to finance, the business, it's generally cash. Now that doesn't mean that the buyer has to have all that, his very own cash. 
he needs to gonna have some, but I've seen them purchased with sometimes the owner of the business will carry that. Yeah, the owner carry situation is what I was um, about to say. They like to carry the land better than the business because it's very hard to repossess a business if they default on it. And they could have run the business into the ground, and then what do you have to repossess? Right. So the owners course. generally don't like to carry on the business, but I've seen a lot of them will get investors to help them out. Some of these guys that come on these outfitted hunts um, have a good amount of money. And I've seen some of them will invest and they'll say, okay, well, I want two elk hunts for the next 20 years. And they they invest into that business and help that outfitter buy it. And he's guaranteeing them. Out. That means the next 20 years, he's providing two hunts that he's not getting paid for because he already got that up front. But that's a way to get that business purchased. Ah, okay. And to, to have an investor that will come in and help invest. And maybe they don't want, maybe just, maybe it's just a normal investor that will invest and want a percentage of the net profit or something down the road. So you can find investors that will help the buyers that want to become the owners run it as well. But ultimately we're, we're putting the cash down for it. Got you. Okay. Because I, I was in thinking about it and we've talked about it before too, just thinking about like going to, going to a, a small business loan and try to talk to them about buying things like horses and mules and like, okay, so now you have to assess you know the valuation. Like that's not going to happen. <laughs> Like, and, and I did money. have a, a lender um, from a bank who did small business association loans. Yeah. And he told me we could do it. And we were looking at doing one on actually a, a fishing and river rafting guide business. Um, but when it came down to it, he couldn't. Um, and it was kind of the fun for that particular business. Maybe if there was another business, maybe they could. Maybe someday I'll see it happen. Um, or somebody that's experienced. If that was your plan. I'd certainly make sure you had a strong backup plan. Yeah, I was going to say because th there's there's lenders out there with experience in certain areas that are very niche oriented. That they'll probably pull it off. I just have in my head going into the urban areas that where small business administrations are and trying to talk to them about buying something with horses and mules and on land that you're leasing and don't own and trying to tell them that it's worth something based on the hunt. And it's just, I'm imagining the person behind the desk, just like, I don't even know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you, you, you need to find somebody that is familiar with what an outfitting and guide business is. Yeah. Um, how they make money, why they make money, because ultimately the small business association is supposed to be for people who are doing something to make money, right? Isn't that what a business is? No matter what the business is, you're doing something in hopes of making money. And that's what the small business association is supposed to support. So I imagine someday we will see somebody be successful with that, um, but it's going to take the right person in the right business. Right. Or, or, or a strong enough business plan that'll support the gap in knowledge because, you know, from the administration that'll be there because it's going to be there. And and if, if there is a strong enough business plan created for that, there's a chance, I think. But it just depends. I just think it would be interesting to be a fly on the wall when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, it, you know, I want to respect time. I always try to like, I always try to cap that, you know, that which is like I blocked people out for like an hour and, and I, I don't want to cut off or anything like that, but I want to give you a chance to bring up anything that we haven't discussed that you think that would be relevant to the conversation that, that would be of value to someone who's interested in the topic. You know, I think, um, the one thing I like to point out is how a real estate broker or somebody like me could help that outfit owner sell their business. A lot of them try to sell it on their own. And, and the analogy I have is that, you know, I've decided when it comes to like home repairs, um, I'm usually better off to let somebody do what they're good at, do my home repair and let me do what I'm good at. Um, if, if I'm going to try to, add an addition or put a new wall in or do some kind of home project. Um, what should be one trip to Home Depot turns into six 
Um, the project delays on forever. There's a mess everywhere and it looks crappy when I'm done, right? That's why I need to let people that are good at what they're doing do it. Let me do what I'm good at. Outfit owners have their own expertise and their own skill set. And sometimes that's not marketing. Um, and sometimes they've got a lot going on and what a broker can do for them is what the broker is good at. We're good at marketing. We're good at contacting people. The other thing a broker can do for an outfitter is there are a lot of tire kickers, okay? I've talked to people who have called me and want to buy an outfitting and guide business, and I really don't think they could get a loan to buy a Ford Pinto, um, you know, let alone an outfitting business worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? And so we screen a lot of those people, and that takes time, which means that gives that outfitter time if somebody else is doing the screening. And we'll vet people. We can answer all those initial questions. We can verify the financing. We can verify the, the skill set that a potential buyer has if they're likely to be approved and actually get a license. And then we can present to that buyer. Eventually, they're going to have to meet and talk about their business. But somebody that we know has a very good likelihood that will be successful when it comes time to close. And we can find those people through our marketing. I was going to say as well, the, and I don't know if you're like me, but professionally, I'm almost a different person than I am. Like if I'm selling something in the open market, like I, and when I've gone through real estate sales, I've used agents and when I'm going through it, if the, if the, it, in a sales situation where if, if the buyer got complicated, my mentality was like, blow it up. I never want to talk to this person again. Get them out of my life. Deal's over. And the real estate agent that I was working with was cool, calm, and collected and held the whole thing to deal to, together. That's that's how I am as a professional. I do that exact same thing. But in my private life, totally different ball game. And in a business transaction where you put your blood, sweat, and tears into it, you see it a lot with farms and ranches and stuff that the seller or the buyer could become volatile and the agent holds the whole thing together. Yes. That, and there are, there are going to be hiccups during the process. You know, the other thing is selling an outfitting and guide business is not your 30 day transaction, you know, like, like selling a piece of property um, because we have to involve getting a license, um, getting approval from the national forest service to allow this new buyer to operate under these permits, um, it takes time. And these transactions should probably be a minimum of three months and could even extend out to six months, depending upon some of the variables in there. And during three months or six months, you're right, there are opportunities for um, feelings to come up or questions to come <laughs> up. Um, that could be there that need to be worked through and and we can help work through those very well stated um todd somebody is looking to uh get rid of an outfitting business in idaho who do they need to talk to how do they get a hold of you uh, well you know what go to nationallandrealty.com look for me in idaho look for an asian idaho i am there um go to that website um, whether you're one, looking to sell an outfit or buy an outfit, because I talk to a lot of people about it, I do have a list of people who are looking for an outfit. There are, um, they're not always coming up for sale. I mean, there's usually always some for sale, but it's not always the right one for the right person for sale, um, I should say. And so I've got, People out there. So if you're looking to sell, I'm in there. If you're looking to buy, let me know. I, I talk to outfitters all the time. And uh, things are always changing with them. Excellent. Well, Todd, I I love the information. Um, is is I think there's a lot of terrific things that we've discussed and a lot of great things that you brought to the table. So thank you very much for your time, man. As always, and I talk to you a lot. We both live in Idaho. I talk to you a lot. Yeah. Um, man, thank you for your time again. Always good to talk to you. 
Absolutely glad I could be here with you, Matt. Thanks for putting this on. This concludes episode number 92 for the National Land Realty Podcast, discussing Quest Hunt with National Land Realty agent in Missouri, Brian Austin. You can learn more about land ownership and the buying and selling of land at nationallands.com.